Welcome to the second module, where we're going to talk about web scraping. And the example we're going to start with in this lecture is scraping land use and building permits from a city website. So we're going to demonstrate how to do this, which you may want to use when an API doesn't exist. We're going to use the beautiful soup library, which is really powerful for library for passing information from web pages. And we're going to, as always, have more practice with pandas. So APIs make it really simple to get data from the web. But they don't always exist because there are a lot of work to set up on the part of the city and agency and to maintain that data. So sometimes they might just give you a web page instead. Well, all is not lost. We can still obtain data from the web, but rather than dropping it directly into a pandas or a geopandas data frame, we're going to do a lot more detective work to understand the structure of the web page and how to clean and process these results. So the example we're going to work through is land use permit data from the city of Seattle. Cities often make their building and land use permit data available through an app API or through a file you can download, but sometimes these are incomplete. They only provide the most common fields, um, those that are relevant to most users, but they might exclude some more esoteric information. So in my work, I'm often interested in parking. And sadly, that's one of the fields that is often left out. So for a recent project, you can read about it here, planning as bargaining. I scraped information from the city of Seattle's website for a project that compared the TOD plans to those in San Francisco. They actually changed their API since, and they actually have parking in the description right now, but they didn't at the time I was doing this study. So it's a great worked example. So the basic Seattle land use permit data set is available through the city's Socrata API in exactly the same way as we saw for the city of Los Angeles in the last, um, last class. And so this land use permit data set is what we're going to use. So let's use this as a starting point. We're going to get this into a pandas data frame in the same way as we did with the, um, the Los Angeles data. So we can see all these um, interesting fields are here. There's lots of columns, the output's truncated. We can explore the contents of this data frame in several ways. And info is a really good starting point when you're not sure what you're getting back. It tells you the list of columns, we have 23. We have an index, which is an integer from 0 to 999. And all of the data types here are objects. So they're strings, basically. And if we want to do some numerical analysis, we're probably going to need to process them in some way. Also tells us about the number of observations. So some of these are complete. We have a 1,000 out of a 1,000. Some of them, there's almost no rows that have data. So notice that there is a link field here. This is going to give us the URL that's going to help us scrape. So let's take it the first one. This is a nice little syntax in pandas, the LOC operator. This is telling us take the row with index 0. In this case, we have an integer sequential index, so 0 is the first um, row. And then we want the column that's called link. And so nest in this column, in this row, we actually have a dictionary. It's not a surprise, or perhaps a surprise to me, but we know how to deal with dictionaries. So for now, let's take a look at what one of these links looks like. What are we expecting to get back? Let's look at it in a web browser. So you see there's a bunch of information and on the project description, and development site, and so on. So that gives us a sense of what we want to get back. And it seems that there's a lot more information here about this particular permit than we could get by the API. In other words, we need to scrape. So the requests library is always a great friend when we're trying to get information off the web. We've used it in the past to get data from an API. It can retrieve pretty much anything from the web. So first of all, let's extract the URL. So we had a dictionary here. Let's just get this value, this string for the URL. So the URL dict, that's what we printed above. 
same as we had before. And let's just take the URL out of this, accessing the dictionary with the URL key. Again, this is a key, and we want this value here. Now we can pass that URL to requests in the same way as we did for the API. Let's take a look and see what is in this R object, what is returned. Now the text attribute is going to give us what's retrieved. So there's a lot of HTML um, and there's a lot of um, kind of garbage for our purposes that we need to get through. But hopefully somewhere further down there's the actual content. But obviously we're going to need to do a lot of detective work to find that content. And this is where the beautiful soup library comes in. It's very well documented. You can click on the link here. So we're going to import it, and then we're going to convert the text that we got back. So this is this mess that I printed above. We're going to use the HTML parser to can turn it into a what we're going to call a soup variable, a beautiful soup object. And what type is it? Well, it's a beautiful soup object. It has lots of attributes and so on, and we can actually look and see what's there. And I'd say pause the video here, take a look, use this dot and then order tab order complete. You could also use help. See what you think you can do with this soup. So let's look and see what is in this soup object. What do we get with the tab auto complete? Okay, we have lots of the can look at the children, lots of options here. Now suppose we want to get information from the project description. This is where the parking information might be included, since there isn't a separate parking field. Again, this is going to be a process of detective work. And sometimes it's useful to look at the output in the develop mode in your browser. So in Safari, I'm going to look at the page source. In Chrome, it's a pretty similar process. So suppose I want to find what is here in the project description and see where this is contained. It looks like it's in this TD tag this information. You can do this in similar in another web browser like Chrome. Um, you can um, just try and find which tags and also which classes are going to enclose the information that you are looking for. So one of the nice beautiful soup functions is find all. And this can find the relevant text that is contained within TD tags. So we're going to put this into a TDS object. Pause the video here, have a look at this TDS object. How can you make use of it? Well, let's have a look. It's a result set, a beautiful soup for result set. What on earth is this? Well, let's look at the documentation. Well, it tells us this is just a list that keeps track of the soup strainer, basically beautiful soups filter, and it keeps track of these results. So it's a list, we can index it. Let's look at the first element. Okay, so this is a subset of the, um, the information that we saw in the raw text. Maybe this isn't what we want. So let's systematically, let's loop through this list to find the element that has this text project description that we were looking before. So we're going to find which of the elements has this text in it. So I'm going to loop through each of these elements of this TDS result, list, result, list, result set, which we can treat as a list. And if I find this string project description in the text of this, we're just going to stop. And then we're going to the TD, this list element is going to be retained so we can look and see at it in more detail. Okay, this looks great. Like we got the text of the website. Um, it looks like it's contained within another set of TD tags. So it's nested one level down. So let's continue our detective work. Let's do exactly the same thing at this second level link. 
So within from TD, let's find all the TD tags and print this TDS2 object. So this is great. We found the information we were looking for. It's in a list here. And this looks like the first element of the list before the comma. And then what we are looking for is in the second element of that list. So let's extract it just using a subscript here and we can print it. Great, we got the text that we wanted. So let's take everything we've done so far and put it in a function. So we, let's recap. For each row of this data frame that we got from Socrata, we have a dictionary with a URL. We called that URL dict. We extracted the URL, the string, from that dictionary. We put it in permit URL. We then requested that URL using requests. We put the response in the R variable. We converted that response to a soup object. We then found all the content in that within TD tags that were in that soup object, put this in a result set that we called TDS. We looped over TDS, we found the one that contained project description. And then we realized that the content we wanted was in the second level of these TD tags, again, one layer down in this nested structure, and we put it in the description variable, and then we got the text from that. So go back above and identify each of these steps, pause the video, see where you can find these in the code above. So that's a lot of steps. So let's write a function that simplifies this, allows us to apply all of these steps to each permit. So we don't just have to copy and paste all this code each time we want to get a single permit. So we're going to call our function get description. And we're going to pass it this URL dictionary that's one of the columns of the data frame and that we started with. And all this is exactly the same as we had before. The only difference is that if we find this project description in the text, we're going to return it. And if we don't find it, so if we loop over all the elements of TDS, and if none of them have project description in their text, we're going to return an empty string. So this code just defines a function. Now let's um, apply it. So let's um, put the first element, the first link in this URL dict variable, and we're going to pass that to the function. And we get back exactly the same we did before. But the nice thing about this, we don't have to just pass this first row to this function. We can pass anything, any URL dictionary we want to this function, and we'll get back a different permit. So again, the advantage of this function is we can apply this procedure to every row of our pandas data frame. So let's just do this for 10 rows, not too many, so we don't disrupt the, disrupt the city's website. Pandas has a great function that's called apply. And what apply does is apply a function. It applies this function to each row of a pandas data frame. So let's do this. Let's create a small data frame just with the first 10 rows. Again, make this more manageable. And then for this small data frame, for the link column, I'm going to apply the get description function. And so what this does is for each of these rows, it takes what's in link and it sends the contents of that column to get description. And it's going to magically appear in this function as a variable URL dict. So the first row is going to be one URL dict, the second row is going to be a different URL dict, and so on. So what does it return? And then we're going to store it in this descriptions um, variable. I just got the error because I was too hasty and ran it before I ran the cell above. So what does the function return? Well, we're going to see it's going to be a pandas series. And a series is basically a one column data frame. And we can see that through printing its type. The star means that this is still running. Let's wait for that to finish. Okay, great, so we get a series. And let's see what this looks like. 
Okay, for each of these permits, we got the text that was nested within this description. So now we can just, this descriptions um, series, we can add this back into the data frame as a new column. So you can see we have the same column as before, but we are going to have a new column on the end that is called new description. So let's stop here for the moment. But we're going to want to come back to this data set in the next lecture. So rather than request the data again from a server, we're going to save it locally as a file. So if you type small data frame 2 and tab complete, you're going to see lots of options for different file formats. Often we'll use 2CSV, which saves it to a plain text format, or 2Pickle, which actually saves a native Python object, in this case, a pandas data frame. For long-term storage or for sharing information, you'll probably want to use a CSV or something similar. But the nice thing about a pickle is it preserves all of these properties of the data frame. So we're going to use 2Pickle, and we're going to save this to the scratch folder in your repository, which should be pre-created. The dot dot here is part of a file path. It means go up one level to the enclosing folder. Then we're going to go down into the scratch folder, and we're going to save it as Seattle Permits Pandas. So that should now be on your hard drive. So let's generalize. What do we do here using Seattle permits as an example? Well, first of all, we got the URL for each web page that we wanted to scrape. Here it was given to us in the city's data file that we got from Socrata, but sometimes we'll have to reverse engineer the composition of a URL if the website owner is not making it easy for us. Then we looked at a sample page, and we identified in Safari, you could use Chrome or Firefox as well, we identified the tags that enclosed the data that we want to extract. Where is the data that we want on this web page? It's often buried in a sea of HTML. Then we wrote a function that pulled out this data for a specific page, and then we applied that function to each URL or each web page. Since our URLs, they were in a pandas data frame already, we could use the pandas apply message, uh, apply function to take that URL, pass it to our function, and then spit back the output that we extracted from that web page. So every scraping page is, project is going to be different. The format in particular is going to be very different for each scrape you do. But normally it's going to involve, at a general level, each of these four steps.